Good afternoon. Oh my gosh, it's amazing to see so many people here. So I'm here today to talk about the most underrated virtue. And because I kind of do a side gig as a teacher, I'm actually not afraid to call you out. So I'm going to get audience participation here. So I see somebody smiling. I'm going to ask, what do you think is the most underrated virtue? Sure. Yes, specifically. Making assumptions. Okay, making assumptions. Yeah. You right here. Humility. Humility. Yes. Bingo. On the nose. You probably were thinking about, you know, all these other things that you could be doing. Product vision, business chops, superior communications. You're looking at yourself and you're like, check, check, check. But I'm here today to talk about humility. Some of you, those who are probably not very humil- uh, have humility right now, are wondering, what is the actual definition of this? And what it is, it's a modest view of one's own importance. Think about that for a second. Evaluate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10. Where are you on the humility scale? So I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes today to talk about why I believe that humility is the number one underrated virtue of a great, successful product manager. My name is AJ Aurora, and if you look me up on LinkedIn, this is what you'd see. I'm Senior Vice President of Product Management at Disney Streaming. My team and I work across multiple product areas, driving growth, driving commerce, experimentation for our streaming services, Disney+, Plus, Hulu, ESPN, etc. I also advise as a product advisor here at Product School, a company that I'm deeply passionate about because of the mission, and I also teach a course at Stanford University. Prior to my time at Disney, I spent four years at Netflix on the growth team, and I led the product team at Audible, Amazon's digital audiobook subscription service. But those are things you find on LinkedIn. Let me tell you about things you won't find on LinkedIn. Turns out I love data. If that means spitting into a test tube to find out my genetic makeup, I'll do it. So I'm 99.8% South Asian, though you wouldn't know it because I actually spent most of my life in Canada and the US. Go Canada, woo! Um, You see, I graduated from engineering at the peak of the dot-com boom, moved to the Bay Area and have uh, been here and around, but uh, back here at home right now. So another thing about me is that I love music. I get my money's worth from Spotify. In terms of, like, you just talk to me about music tips, and I'm there. I like to brag about my rap summary. You can see, you know, hip-hop and dance, and the South Indianness comes through as Bhangra, number four. Also, I love entertainment. I love movies. It's not surprising for someone who worked at Netflix, now at Disney, who doesn't love movies, right? Turns out, I can point to certain movies that's changed the trajectory of my life. Who is a Matrix fan? Matrix fan? Oh, nice! Woo! It's hard to believe that this movie came out in March 1999. We're all dating ourselves here. But there is one scene in The Matrix, the first one, that literally changed my growth trajectory. It's this scene right here. You see in this scene, let's kick it off. Operator. Tank, I need a pilot program for a B-212 helicopter. Hurry. Let's go. Boom. Do you guys remember that scene? Yes? Okay. So until they invent a neural link that can basically just say, hey, download a helicopter manual into my brain, I will sign up when that's available. But until then, I find myself to be a perpetual student. I love learning new things, and I want to find a way that, like, how can we learn things faster, even better? But let's stop talking about me. Let's talk about all of you. These incredible product managers that in some respects are actually more like superheroes. You see, 
I know what your day is like. You're sitting in the room, being cool as Clark Kent, but when things go crazy, everybody goes, let's look at the product manager. What do we do? You change into your superhero outfit. It doesn't help that there's so much pressure on you from companies like Amazon, where they have leadership principles, principle number four. Our leaders are right a lot. It doesn't help, it doesn't help. So I'm here to tell you, look, I know, I've been there, I'm wrong a lot, and I'm proud of it. I'm gonna walk you through some examples. It turns out that some of my biggest career successes actually were because I was wrong. So I'm gonna give you two examples. The pinnacle of my you know, achievement at, at my time at Audible and a story from my time at Netflix. But here's something I'm extremely proud of when I was at Audible. We launched a product that the Wall Street Journal called the killer app for books. It's quite a compliment when you think about it. Books have been around for hundreds of years. They say you've got the killer app. You know, it's, it's kind of nice. So let me tell you what we did. You see, we had this crazy cool idea that we take a Kindle book, we suck out all the words. We take an audio book professionally narrated and we do speech to text and we get the words there and we do some magic and we sync it together. We invented something cool. It was called immersion reading. Any immersion reading fans out there? No, crickets, crickets. Okay, but maybe, maybe if I show you an example, you'll be convinced. You see, immersion reading is super cool in the sense that you can simultaneously read and listen so you can immerse yourself deeper into the story. Are you sold? Okay, maybe. Okay, let me give you a demo. Let's see if I can convince you with this book. Friday, December 20th. The trial was irretrievably over. Everything that could be said had been said. But he had never doubted that he would lose. The written verdict was handed down at ten on Friday morning, and all that remained was a summing up from the reporters waiting in the corridor outside the district court. Karl Mikhail Blomqvist saw them through the doorway and slowed his step. Okay, come on. Right? That was kind of cool. That was kind of cool, right? So let me tell you how this story goes. You launch the product, and basically you send the fire hose of Amazon traffic it looks good. Then this happens. The product bombed. Here we are, pumping through tons of AW instances, cranking through all these books, trying to make this product work, and nobody's buying it. So our team is like heartbroken, and we go back, and you know what we do? We actually talk to users. Imagine that, right? We try to like see, can we take this product that's not working so well and make it successful? And we had some insights. And let me tell you what happened next. Wish you had more time to read? When you put down your Kindle, pick up right where you left off in your audiobook. Amazon has a new app called Whisper Sync that's somehow giving people more time to read. Welcome to WSJ Live. I'm Simon Constable. We've got Market Watch's Jeremy Olshin here, who has a story and is an avid reader and uh, is going to explain how all of this works. Thank you for being here. My pleasure, Simon. Well, now you know how it works. If you want to know more, I'll happily tell you. But did you see what happened there? Did you see what happened? Customers didn't want to read and listen at the same time. Avid readers never want to put down a good book. So the insight was, how do you take this cool technology that we built and make it so that you know, you're reading at home, you want to hop in the car, you want to continue where that book leaves off. We pivoted. It wasn't a blockbuster, but it's a pretty great product. Amazon, uh, in, their, in their earnings uh, shareholder letter, they talk about it. Bezos himself encourages you to try it. I encourage you as well. And you can see it live today. When you try to buy a Kindle book today, you'll see a checkbox add Audible, and I'm proud it still exists. You see, that was the highlight of my time at Amazon, and the highlight of my time at Netflix was right here. I was in New Delhi, India, for a new product launch. I was proud to announce this new tier called the mobile tier. You see, what was happening was 
during this time, we're trying to crack growth in India and in Indonesia and other markets, but the growth just wasn't picking up. I had a thought. I was like, our pricing just seems way off. And so what we did is we basically, you know, work with the team to understand like, look, there's a basically a demand curve and we follow the price, high price, look at this quantity. You drop the price, we increase the quantity. It actually seemed very simple. I was like, guys, I think I've cracked it. This is what we're going to do. So my hypothesis was simple. We're going to drop the price of Netflix in these regions by 50%. And in turn, we're going to increase our signups by 50%. It's going to be brilliant. It's going to work. Can anybody guess what happened? Yes, I'm predictable. It did not work. It did not work. Let me actually tell you what happened. You see, we dropped the price by 50%. Did signups increase? Yes, marginally. But can you imagine what happens to revenue when you drop the price by 50% and not enough people sign up? It is scary. In fact, I commend the team to have that fortitude to let the experiment run. Something magical happened. The first month renewal comes through and the people who signed up on this lower plan, they actually liked it. And the retention was awesome. And month after month, these people were loving the product. And what happens in the subscription business, it's not about the sign up, it's about the retention as we just heard. And it made the day. It made it so that this product actually worked. Here's a headline from shortly thereafter. Nearly half of Netflix's growth comes from Asia Pacific and that mobile tier had a big role to play. But guess what? The truth is, I was wrong. So let's talk about humility. What is it? Basically, it's multidimensional. I want you to be thinking about, you know, openness and awareness and taking different perspectives. You see, any fans of We Crashed? Anybody watching We Crashed? On, on, oh yeah, I see a couple. Great story. Uh, and, you know, I watched it. I was like, I want to learn more about the WeWork story. And so I picked up this book called Billion Dollar Loser. And I got a great story for you. Here's how not to act. So you see, when Adam Newman, the founder and CEO, was trying to take WeWork public the first time, he went to Wall Street analysts and he was so proud. He basically professed, we have never closed a building. To which point, an analyst from the back shouts out saying, hey, while that sounds like an achievement, it doesn't make any sense. You see, of the more than 500 different buildings you've opened, the fact that you've never made a single mistake, not very humble, is it? So, I want to give you some tools and techniques, because one thing to say it's very important to be humble, drive for humility, and then just walk off the stage. But I'm actually going to give you four tips and tricks that I think would be helpful as you think about your product journey. So I want you to, these are all like cute little stories around embracing humility, preparing to fail, calibrating your decisions, and promoting dissent. So let's start with embracing humility. It's somewhat ironic. I'm going to use venture capital as an example here, but I'm going to do it. So Forbes has this great list. It's called the Midas list. This is like ranking the VCs that they touch a startup and it turns into a unicorn. It turns into gold, that's just like Midas. But I was looking through that list and I found an interesting example here. Bessemer Venture Partners, one of the oldest venture capitalist firms here in the US. You go to their website and they've got this cool little tab. It's called the Anti-Portfolio. And here's how it goes. Ordering the companies that we missed. And it's a really interesting, humble example where they basically present this list to you. We recognize many of these names, I'm sure. Apple, Airbnb, you see Google, you see Facebook, Tesla, Zoom, and you click your mouse over it, and what it shows you is the story of how the founder or the entrepreneur went to Bessemer, wanted to raise money for, let's say, Intel or PayPal, and they said no, only to watch that startup do amazingly well. And why is that encouraging? Because now, if you're a venture capitalist working at Bessemer, or an entrepreneur that's pitched there, you understand that, look, they make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. It's cool. Drives humility. I think humility and experimentation go hand in hand. 
And if you're looking for something great to read, I encourage you to check out this book, this article on Harvard Business Review, Building a Culture of Experimentation. In fact, they profile these great companies, and there's a lot of humility there. In fact, the one that stands out the most is Booking.com. Booking.com is a role model. They're doing thousands of experiments any given time. And what they tell their team and their employees is that nine out of ten experiments fail. Now, if you're a product manager at Booking.com and you see this, how do you feel? Think about that for a second. I know how I would feel. I would feel comfortable taking some bigger swings, knowing that it's going to be okay. And it's okay to make mistakes because a lot of things just don't work out. The next lesson I want to share with you is preparing to fail. Before I do that, let me first do a round of、uh, hands. How many of you do post mortems? Post mortems in the house? Nice, nice, nice. I saw about 80% of the hands go up. How many of you do pre mortems? I see about 5%. Good. I've got a lesson for you all. So, I want you to look up a pre mortem. A pre mortem is an amazing technique and it's been proven. Here's what happens there's this concept called perspective hindsight. If you imagine what can go wrong, you're more likely to predict the failures in advance. And it's so shockingly simple, you should all be doing this. Five simple steps. I'm going to basically walk you through it. You're working on a project, you're about halfway through. And you get your team together and said, Team, we're going to do a pre mortem. Half the team is going to be shocked and confused, but it's okay. What you're going to do, you put them in a room and you're going to say, Imagine the future. We just launched this product that's near and dear to our hearts, but it failed miserably. And then you're going to ask everyone to fill out some post it notes on why do they think it failed. You're going to discuss why they think the project failed, and you're going to review it together. And I promise you, You're going to be thinking about your project differently. You're going to be thinking about making sure your customer、uh, care agents are better prepared. You're going to think twice about you know, working with your comms and PR team. You're going to be fixing those edge cases that you thought maybe、ah, we can skip this. So I encourage you all to be thinking like this. Another trick that I picked up during my time at Amazon, and Jeff Bezos talks about this a ton, is this concept around one way door and two way door decisions. How many of you use this framework? Okay, good. But 10%. Cool. So you'll pick something up here too. What's a one way door? A one way door is a decision that is difficult to reverse. It's like you go down a certain path, you can't go back. You can't put that genie back in the bottle, is how I think about it. The two way doors, very different. You can make a decision, and if it doesn't work out, no problem. You can simply go back. It's going to be okay. So now, when I'm sitting with my team, we, the first question we ask ourselves wait, is this a one way door or a two way door decision? In fact, I've got three tips for you. The first one is to identify when we're making a decision is this one way or two way? If we can make this a two way, two way door decision, we will do that. For example, can we do like an MVP? Can we iterate? How can we leverage our experimentation platform such that if this does not work out, we can just roll it back? And inevitably, there are going to be decisions that are going to be a decision that's going to be a one way door. We're going to do something we can't turn back. And for those ones, you want to spend most of your time, you want to spend your brain cycles, you want to be doing a lot of moderation, a lot of discussion, a lot of engagement. You really want to make that right decision. Critical tool. Finally, my last story for you is promoting dissent. Might be uncomfortable, but let me tell you what that means. So, I start off the talk talking about all these things I'm proud of, all these great products I've launched. But you see this logo for that Audible icon right there on this device? Yep, that was me and my team. We spent two years of our life working on this really cool app for the Fire Phone. Any Fire Phone users out there? No, no, didn't work out.、Um, so, you know, of course, Amazon had this miss. They talk about it a lot. There's another company that had a pretty big miss, right? This is Netflix, right? In 2011, The stock dropped 71%. Kind of deja vu, I know, it's kind of crazy.、Uh, but the stock drops, and Reed Hastings does an interview and he talks about like, what went wrong? 
And Reed's very, you know, honest about it. He's like, look, you know, I was been running uh, Netflix for such a long time. I made some decisions. Things are going well. And my team was just uncomfortable disagreeing with me. They thought, you know, Reed's been right so often. He's probably right with this idea around Quickster. Not so much. So the culture at Netflix is pretty amazing because they promote dissent and they have this concept called farming for dissent. And the way it works is the following. I'm going to give you an example. This is not an actual Netflix memo. I've picked up this concept and basically all the strategy docs at Netflix are written in Google Docs. What do you do? You write the memo, you share it, you share it broadly. You turn you know, comment access on and you want people to comment. You want them to poke holes at your arguments. You want them to you know, just tell you where you could be sharpening up this idea, how you could be testing it better. This is such a valuable tool that I've been now using it while I'm teaching my course at Stanford. In fact, all my courseware is in Google Docs because when a student has an idea or is poking, they're actually making it better for the future students of the course. And so I encourage you to have this mindset of like writing your ideas down, opening up for examination and getting people to help you make it stronger. Another cool trick at Netflix that actually promotes dissent further is this is an actual conference room at Netflix. Right? This is where, when I was proposing this mobile tier, this is where I was. You know, the seats are filled with your colleagues, people in like customer care and product and experimentation, and you're presenting your idea. It's very democratic where people try to poke ideas. Are you thinking about this? Are you thinking about that? And of course, you know, how to set up the experiment successfully. So I encourage you, as your fourth takeaway, promote the sense as a product manager. And with that, Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for joining us here at ProductCon. Celebrate the learnings. Be humble. Thank you.